either. <laughs> well, and I guess I should introduce you better because <laughs> I just kind of jumped in there. But um, so you came to Google after a, a, a good career at AWS. Um, and you're going to help us work through GKE for folks who are very familiar with EKS, right? That's, that's exactly it. All right. Well, cool. So tell us just a little bit more about yourself. So I can't do justice, man, but, um, you know, just give us a little more intro. So like you mentioned, I was five years as solutions architect at AWS. I specialize in DevOps and containers. I've helped lots of customers work through EKS and be successful with it. Uh, I've also given lots of presentations, workshops for cus for customers when I was at AWS on containers. I've spoken at reInvent, Public Sector Summit, and a bunch of other things for customers. And yeah, today I'm here to talk to you about what to expect from GKE if you've used EKS or used to one of those managed container services. Well, that's great because I know you could fit all I know in a thimble <laughs> about um, container uh, technologies, well, maybe a little more, but uh, <laughs> it's great to have someone who's, who's seen it from both perspectives. Um, so I, I think we should just jump right in because uh, that's there's no other way, right? Let's just um, get into GKE and EKS and do some comparison here. Sure. And, and, and I guess to get started, the stuff that EKS users should know uh, at a high level Kubernetes is maintained by Google, so that's something you should know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Google open source Kubernetes, and, but is also very involved in its development. You can see that from the metrics of check-ins into the Kubernetes uh, source. Uh, GKE is now five years old, it's a toddler. Uh, and you know, you'll know you find the best of Kubernetes and you'll also find a first class managed service. I mean, that's really what you should know if you're coming from EKS. Yeah. So we we developed we built this technology. I think it was out of um, something we called Borg here to run like all of the Google search infrastructure and Gmail and so forth. Um, yeah, there's, there's a there's a lot of different technologies that go into GKE. Borg is one of the big ones, but yeah, it's essentially uh, a distillation of what Google has learned about managing things at scale. And it's being made, and it, it's a typical story for Google Cloud. It's a lot of technology that Google was perfected for managing. It's over nine different products that serve over a billion customers and wow. providing it for you so you can make use of it to serve crazy amounts of customers as well. <laughs> well, I won't, I won't keep interrupting you too much. Um, where should we go to sort of get our users started, I guess? So... Uh, so a great a good place to get started is how you would actually get started using GKE. Uh, now, in terms of a comparison, you know, it just like in it, GKE is just like other cloud providers. There's you, there's a console, and then there's also typically some side of command line interface. I, I like to use the command line interface. In fact, uh, the one I like to use is this one that you get free with a Google Cloud called uh, Cloud Shell, and you can see it here. Cloud Shell includes not only a console that it's, it's, it's inside your VPC, so you don't have to worry about setting up networking or spinning up a jump box or any of this type of stuff, and it's free. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it'll be familiar for customers who've used something like the Cloud9 product. Uh, so, but like I said, it's free. Gives you five gigs of persistent storage, and like I said, you don't have to worry about setting up any funky networking stuff to make it work. And uh, you know, it comes with a, a, a Ubuntu-based Linux, so you can actually add stuff to it. The home disk is all, the home volume is actually what's persisted though. So if you mm -hmm. want to keep stuff between iterations, you may have to do boot up scripts or something like that. But yeah, I, I like I like Cloud Shell. It's very nice. And like I said, it has both a terminal as well as a nice little editor. You see yeah. here, it's very familiar for folks who've used lots of editors before. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, it, so I talked a little bit about Cloud Shell and told you what it is. Now, in terms of what typically folks get started with EKS, it, typically you would get started using EKS CTL. Uh, there's multiple ways you can create a cluster in EKS, though, uh, but you, you'll find that EKS CTL is the easiest way to get started, at least the easiest way to get using kube control. And that's really what folks want when they're running kubernetes is they want to get to kube control as quickly as possible. 
what you'll find is that the other ways of creating a cluster aren't as straightforward as what you get with EKS uh, CTL. So, um, for example, if you look at the documentation for creating a cluster using EKS CTL, it's about five steps. With AWS console, it's actually 13 steps in the documentation, which is interesting because you'd think usually a console would be a lot easier to use than, than doing it using a command line tool. And the CLI makes it for EKS makes it seem like it would only be about seven steps using just the AWS um, uh, API, but that's because it refers to a lot of other documentation and basically expects that you actually did a bunch of stuff beforehand. So it's actually far more than 13 steps. Uh, the good news for you is that when it comes to GKE, the actual command to, for example, create a cluster is about one line. So what you see here is, and the command I just gave, which is uh, which is a CLI command for using the G Cloud API for for setting up a cluster. And by the way, Cloud Shell comes with the G Cloud API and SDK installed. It also yeah. comes with a bunch of different editors and supports for different programming languages, like you have Git installed, Python installed, a bunch of editors, all sorts of stuff like that for doing development. And then you can use, you know, whatever tooling to install additional packages for doing development. So you see you literally just created a cluster with like one command and four arguments. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that command. So one of the cool things you'll notice about Google Cloud is that there is to get make it easy to use. There's also some good options by default that are se selected. So for example, that command I did it enables auto upgrade so that the cluster can be auto upgraded, and, and that's something that can be managed by Google with no downtime. The other thing it does is enable auto scaling for the cluster, so they can add additional instances based off of whatever you select for your auto scaling options, and then it sets the the, the zone and then it sets the amount of nodes that you can have. And you can have a, also a multi-regional, multi-zonal cluster as well, instead of just one zone, the different pricing. So that's one of the things you'll find in Google Cloud is that there's a lot of good defaults for how you do stuff, but then it's still very powerful in terms of what the options can actually do for you. And that's, a, that's something that you'll see as a continuous theme. You'll see stuff that it's easy to use, but it's actually powerful because it gives you a lot of control over things, but the defaults are actually really powerful as well because it, it, it assumes, it gives you a lot of options. That's how you can do things. So like I mentioned before, it'll have managed nodes group, auto scaling, encrypting Kubernetes secrets. Nice. Well, um, you know, I'm not sure what all we get when we create a cluster, I'm guessing you're going to walk us through that. <laughs> sure. So that cluster I created, it takes about four minutes to uh, set, set up a cluster in uh, GKE. Uh, so in comparison to other providers, you can do that. But this is what you would get in the GKE console uh, when you spin up a cluster. OK. <laughs> So you see here, uh, this is a very mature product. So there's a lot of different options here, stuff you can do. You can do release channels, which is something we can talk about a little bit. You can do upgrades for your cluster. Uh, you can also immediately jump into logs. We'll talk about that a little later as well. But then some of the really cool stuff here that you, you'll be hard pressed to find this in other places. Like for example, you're able to enable cloud TPU as, as, uh, as an option for the nodes in your, in your, in your um, your node groups. You right. also have the ability to deploy Istio from just by editing here. I mean, it's a lot of powerful stuff. You can also enable Cloud Run for Anthos, which allows you to run Cloud Run functions uh, directly on uh, on your cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have options for stuff like binary authorization, which allows you to make to have faith in the, the, the containers that are deployed in your cluster. A lot of stuff here, uh, node local DNS cache. I mean, it, this is a, a lot of big differentiators for Kubernetes in here. Um, yeah, I would imagine that like that all that, so is it that all of that stuff is just not available in, in a clickable form on other platforms, well, not EKS, but. So, so let, just to give you an example, here's the console for EKS. So you can get into and see the node groups, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't, for example, trigger auto scaling or configure auto scaling for your node group from here. Okay. Uh, logging is really about control plane. It doesn't do anything for your application logs. So, you know, that's two clicks inside of the GKE console. It's not really something that's here. The networking section is really about the AWS primitives, not really about Kubernetes networking. Uh, okay. Where, you know, over here you can do things like node local DNS caching and stuff like that, which is really about the, uh, Kubernetes configuration. 
So it's just a, there's a lot more here, a lot more capability. It's not saying you can't do some of this stuff in other cloud providers. It's just not as easy to use. I see. No, I get it now. So one of the things I want to mention in terms of that ease of use and power is this whole notion of a, of a release channel. So what we find is a lot of customers want, when it comes to Kubernetes, are real specific about which version they want to run. And they want to be able to have a lot of control over which version gets their workloads get deployed in. So the solution that for GKE was to, have, to allow the notion of what's known as a release channel. And what it does is that essentially when it comes to Kubernetes, you have two options. You can either, GKE, you have two options. You can either run a specific version of Kubernetes that you select, or you can run uh, a version of Kubernetes that's kind of curated by Google. And essentially Google will, will help manage the upgrades for that in a cycle. And that's what the release channels are. And there's essentially two release channels. Uh, there's a rapid channel and a regular channel. Mm -hmm. Rapid channel is actually only a few weeks after what gets uh, out of the Kubernetes community. So you'll see here, they're up to some very late versions. The regular channel is a few months after whatever is in the community. So you, you can basically look at it as staggered release. And so what that allows you to do is if you select a, a, a regular channel, it's usually more stable and it's usually, it's actually the fault in GKE when you create a cluster. It'll allow you to then have a version of Kubernetes that's a little bit staggered behind what's in the regular community. But then we will actually, if you select the option, actually upgrade it with no downtime for you. So we'll upgrade the masters and then you can select to upgrade the nodes with no downtime. Uh, and of course, to make that work, there's a bunch of things in there. For example, there's this notion of what's known as a surge upgrade for your node. So the idea is that you don't have to worry about that stuff, but then you still have control over which version your workload runs in. And you can choose to run your workload on the rapid channel, which is a couple of weeks past what's in what's out there in the, in the wild, or you can run it on the regular channel and have be confident about it. Uh, about it being pretty stable and not having any issues. So one of the things folks do is that they use a rapid channel to do their testing and then run their prod in a release in a regular channel. Yeah. Also have what's known as an alpha cluster in GKE. And this is what gives you the ability to run what literally was just come out of the Kubernetes environment. So the only thing about an alpha cluster is that it doesn't have an SLA like all the other, the, 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 like a regular cluster in GKE. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, but that gives you the ability, for example, to run stuff that's burning, that's just coming out in the environment. Yeah, and I think that's what, you know, there's so many controls and the ability to customize this. I don't, I don't know that we think of it as a managed service, but that, that really highlights that it is truly a managed service. I mean, GCP is going to manage the upgrading of the cluster depending on the, the type of channel you choose. That, that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and it, 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 the thing about it is that what customers want is to be able to have, to be able to choose a specific version of it, but then they want to be able to have faith that their cluster is stable and that stuff isn't broken. And then, for example, if they, they want to get the latest and greatest out there, that the, the process of being able to have that upgrade work seamlessly is, 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 is important. So, and that's why I was saying about the GKE, it's easy but powerful. There's a lot of underlying tech that G, uh, Google puts into it but then it makes it really easy for you to interface with it. I mean, all you have to do to be able to have the latest and greatest is to pick a, a release channel and then Google will manage it for you. And then you can come in here and whatever is the latest out there in Kubernetes, you can be sure that you'll be able to access it. So how do I kind of, like, let's say I want to watch and see what's, what's going on, like different events and um, I see your clusters already deployed that demo. Yeah, that's, that cluster is already up. So yeah. one of the cool things about GKE, so this is a, a newly created cluster and right away you're able to jump in and see the logs for it. And this is not only uh, the, the control plane logs, but also the application logs for it. So this okay. is a, a, a feature we have called the Log Explorer, which is a part of our logging and uh, monitoring platform for GKE. So logging and monitoring is actually a big capability across Google Cloud. And specifically, there's capabilities for individual services when it comes to logging and monitoring. And this is what you get with GKE. So you see here, it's pretty flexible. I mean, it has stuff in here like you have, um, you have autocomplete, you can actually create what's known as filter metrics so that you can then use that to set up an SLI to be able to establish some little SLO for being able to determine what your SLAs are for your application. 
Mm -hmm. so see here, it has auto completion, so that you know, kind of cool. Allows you to be able to uh, look brilliant when you're trying to look at, go through your logs. And so this is what's available by default. You don't you don't have to do anything to have this enabled. And I can show you what it looks like for. I have another cluster here that has an, some apps deployed in it, and the logs for that show up here as well. And then you can go down into the individual application and see and see the logging for an individual application. For example, resource. Let's see. Let's look at different logs. Let's look at a log for a service. Yeah. And let's pick another service. Let's pick a payment service. Let's see, that one. Let's see if that has any log data. Eh, there's nothing there. We're betting a thousand here. Yeah, pretty much. But the, the, the notion of it is that this is pretty easy to use, man. And this comes out of the box. You don't really have to do any configuration for this. Underneath this, this is running on some of this is Fluent D plugins that enable logging to, it used to be called Stackdriver. Uh, you can also add your own custom Fluent D configuration as well. So you can have that running in addition to this Fluent D configuration that really feeds into our logging and monitoring. And that's mm -hmm. what the logging portion is. The monitoring portion of it is here as well. And let me show you what that looks like. So this is something that comes by default. You don't have to do anything to configure this. You can also configure uh, as you, if I, I could show you this in a second, but you can also configure uh, Prometheus inside of your GKE cluster as well. But this comes from, uh, this is built uh, from us, uh, it's Google. And so this is, you can look at stuff based on your cluster, nodes, work. Uh, you can dive into specific services and see what's there. You can, remember I was saying how you can establish SLIs to be able to set up SLOs mm -hmm. for your applications. The, the dashboard is pretty nice and you, uh, you can set up dashboards for a bunch of different applications and you can actually create your own dashboards, but we also have pre-built ones for services and this is the pre-built one for GKE. And like I see, you can do stuff based on nodes, workloads, containers, you can see statistics on stuff, you can dive into it. You can actually manage it by getting access to another part of the console so you can get access to the, the YAML file for a particular service. And like I was saying that you can see the logs for, you can get logs or audit logs for your different applications. So here's one of the applications. You can see logs for it. It goes then, pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. And it, it's one of the things that folks always have a challenge with when running container apps is how do I make use of logging? And that's, that's the solution to that. There's a lot of solutions to that that are implemented in GKE to make it as easy as possible. And then we follow what the community does, what's popular. So that's why, for example, our stuff is implemented as Flint D <laughs> because that's where the community is. Okay, cool. Well, I saw some alerting. I saw a number of things that were available. Um, I know I've done a few uh, exercises with you trying to, to learn up. And I know that alerting on these metrics is um, particularly easy to do as well. Yeah, so you can set up what's known as log-based metrics. So if you have something coming into your log file, for example, a 500 error, you can set up a, a metric based off of that. So if, if, for example, you can count the amount of uh, log errors and then basically have that be able to trigger uh, a, a, a metric. And then mm -hmm. that metric can then be used to set up some sort of alerting. The other thing about this logging is that we have a capability known as log routing. So all you, what you can, the log routing is really cool because what it allows you to do is set up what's known as a sync. There's a default sync set up for you for a cloud logging bucket, which is a special type of bucket that you can use for locking. But you can also set up syncs to send to Google Cloud Storage. Another really cool thing is you can set up syncs to send to PubSub. So for example, if you want out of the box, you're able to set up real-time monitoring of your logging information using PubSub, which as you know, is our, you know, our live streaming data platform. The other thing is that you can use this to set up a sync to another project. So what that means is that as you set up your Google GK clusters across lots and lots of different projects, you could actually merge all of that logging and monitoring information into a single project. So it makes it easy to set up like a federated setup. Like say you're an organization that has multiple users and you need to log all that information in one place. You can do that out of the box using the sync capability for, for logging. 
uh, that I, I love this man. I know that like with a pub sub queue, for example, that you know those syncs will be in almost instantaneous. So mm -hmm. uh, nothing really holds you back there. You can even set it to BigQuery as well. So you could, I mean, pub sub is nice. You can do near real time. You can also use BigQuery for real time. And then BigQuery has features like BigQuery ML. So you could use machine learning on your logging for your containers in about five minutes. I mean, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, now BigQuery, that's my jam. Now we're now we're getting somewhere for me to, to play. Um, and I do know that we have awesome solutions like Chronicle um, that that use the logging mechanisms to uh, inside Big or from here inside BigQuery to actually do some really cool um, aggregation of logs and um, security. Uh, review of those, but um, I'm I'm kind of getting into security now. I hope that's okay. <laughs> that no, not a problem. Not a problem. problem. That's definitely a good place to 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 talk. Uh, so some of some of the stuff that folks should know if they're coming from EKS. Uh, one of the big things is that RBOC and IAM are are single sources of truth in GKE. What that means is that that gives you a lot of sanity. Like you don't have to do special hookups to be able to use RBOC to be able to provide access, and it integrates fairly well with IAM. So that's something that you should know off the top. Another, another big thing to know is that you can do a GKE sandbox leveraging GVisor. So what that does is if you have if you want to have a cluster that's running lots and lots of different workloads and you want to protect that cluster from a particular workload, you can leverage the GKE sandbox. Uh, we also have a lot of different things related to trusted computing and confidential computing. We have shielded VMs. We also have v confidential VMs that allow you to be able to essentially ensure that there's encryption used when stuff is running inside of your workload. So there's a lot of, the story here is that there's a lot of security features implemented in GKE. It's a reflection of how, how this technology was developed inside of Google to, because we have high security requirements as well. And then also based off of what customers demanded in order to be able to have confidence. For example, a confidential computing is a huge differentiator. Being able to ensure that no access, even something running on the same machine as your other workloads would not be able to access the memory being used by something else. I mean, that's actually a pretty big deal. Yeah, I, and I think I would love to spend another hour. I'm gonna beg you to come back and talk about security um, just in G because it is um, comprehensive and, um, a lot of angles get covered. I mean, I know it's quick to stand up a cluster uh, and, and get going. I think that's awesome. And I know our IM is amazing, um, especially compared to, to some of the competitors. I'm just going to be honest. Like, I think some of those competitors can be fairly complex and um, ours is, is quick to get going and use. But having a, a little bit more in-depth review of what we can do in GK would be awesome. So I'm going to beg you to come back for that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because like I said, there's a lot to the security story. <laughs> All right, man. Well, um, you know, just trying to think of um, some other things. I mean, I get a lot of customers that, that I end up deferring to someone else <laughs> to talk about GKE networking. Um, I think we have a few advances in GKE networking maybe you can share, but um, honestly, like it's a little bit above my understanding. Sure. So the big picture that folks should know is that uh, GKE is built on top of the Google Cloud infrastructure. Google Cloud infrastructure is built upon one of the most unique uh, networking uh, situations that you'll find anywhere. Uh, long story short, there's capabilities like global VPC, global load balancing, and these are all things that you can leverage as a part of your GKE cluster. Uh, premium tier networking is another feature. I would love to talk about more about that, but what it comes to, the, the thing to know is that GKE allows you to define network declaratively in a way that's portable. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big things about Google Cloud is we like to support workloads that work in lots of different environments. So GKE, the way you can define networking allows you to do things like policy, uh, load balancing, a lot of different capabilities declaratively such that it can run on-prem, it can mm -hmm. run in other clouds, it, it can also interoperate on VMware and also in GKE. So there's a lot of capabilities there. Uh, network policy enforcement, for example, is something you do declaratively. So that means you can set it up, it'll work fine in GKE, it'll also work fine on-prem. Uh, another big differentiator is uh, what's known as container native load balancing, which is what this graphic shows here, which is 
in the typical container, the managed container space, what ends up happening is that load balancing actually comes into and, and gets routed to the node and then gets routed to your pod. So essentially it has at least one extra step coming from the load balancer before it hits your actual container. Well, right. in, when container native load balancing, what ends up happening is that we skip the VM step. So essentially you go from what's known as a network endpoint group directly to the container. So that keeps, you just there's no hop to a VM where you have to use IP tables, for example, to get to the, the pod. So that's a huge differentiator because if you think about how much latency that can potentially save you for the different types of workloads. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, in, in some of our customers, uh, individual milliseconds, if they can trim that off, they will, you know, trading applications or, um, you know, really any high speed app, they're going to, they're going to trim off all of the hops and all of the latency. Absolutely. So when you talk about scalability, because that's, that's a, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's always something we love to talk yeah. about. It's so yeah. Easy. Yeah, so I know this is probably a huge difference to folks coming from other managed container services. So let's just go through some of the big numbers. You can have a 15,000 node cluster. You can have 150,000 pods and up to 300,000 containers. <laughs> <laughs> so you shouldn't have any problem with growth. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had a website that could test that. I would. <laughs> Well, I don't know. They put that with uh, with some of the Nintendo uh, products all the time, actually. <laughs> well, I uh, it's certainly larger than I'll ever need it, at least imaginably. But um, sure. one day I'll be running uh, Jack's website dot coms. I don't need three hundred thousand containers. <laughs> Absolutely. Another thing too is that with GKE, uh, so a lot of folks have support for horizontal pod auto scaling, uh, uh, EKS for example, but GKE supports horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Another thing is GKE has a feature known as auto repair. Uh, so if, if GKE mo constantly monitors your, your nodes in your cluster and if it notices something is wrong, it's actually able to put in another node for it and it should be seamless uh, for, your, uh, for your application. Um, so that's something that gives you confidence knowing that you can grow and not have to worry about having availability issues. Uh, yeah. necessarily. Is that scaling fairly straightforward to enable? I mean, I, I've never tried to, to set up scaling like that. Oh, uh, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So one of the cool things is if you go in here and you pick a particular service instead of uh, using here, mm -hmm. you can actually select the auto scale just from our console. So if you okay. deploy a service, this is immediately available for you. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> it's that easy. And you can just choose the, the number and percentage yeah. target to decide yeah, the scale. Yeah. Metric you want to use, memory, if you want to use a custom metric. So if you have a log metric, for example, if you want to keep a count of how many users are on a box using a log metric, which you can easily do from setting up a log metric using logging, then okay. you can use that as an auto scaling metric here. And uh, and then set up how much you want to grow based off upon the percentage, number of replicas, actually number of replicas. Pretty easy. <laughs> nice, nice. I like that a lot. Yeah, I mean, we try to make it easy, man. Yeah, I need to. It makes me look smarter <laughs> when, <laughs> when I do these amazing things with ease. So uh, I'm all in. So yeah, the, the only other thing I want to say is about what to expect is that. Uh, Google is a very open source friendly company and we, we feel the love and we share the love with the open source community. So not only do you see Google contribute to several open source products, projects, and actually Google created several open source projects and then gave them back to the community. Uh, we're also actively involved in many open source projects like Kubernetes. GKE runs certified Kubernetes so that you can be confident your workload will work wherever you're, you have certified Kubernetes. And GKE is constantly updated. You'll see that. I mean, even the nature of having the release channel shows you that there's stuff always happening inside of GKE space. Uh, you'll also find it easy to leverage the latest in the Kubernetes ecosystem inside of GKE. And that's because, quite frankly, a lot of the, the uh, Kubernetes eco ecosystem products are actually tested on GKE first. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no problem with that at all. I mean, uh, I like that we're, you know, We've shared this with the world. Uh, a lot of the other cloud providers have picked it up, and 
um, we're continuing to help innovate across really the world in this situation. And uh, it's something that makes me proud to be a Googler, if you will. Absolutely. And then what you'll notice is that the love is both ways because several open source solutions are available on GCP. So a lot of folks, and then you can leverage them in your GKE cluster. Uh, we have what's known as a GKE workplace, which allows you to leverage stuff that runs on for Kubernetes pretty easily, just one click actually. So you'll find stuff like Mongo Lab, Cassandra. Uh, you'll find many popular open source solutions available that offered as a managed service in GS GCP, and that's actually being run by the developers themselves. That's a difference you'll find in other cloud providers is where you find some cloud providers may try to create their own fork and stuff like that. You won't see that in our Google Cloud. We work directly with the developers. Nice. Well, uh, there's so much to talk about, man. Like I wish, I think we can spend hours and hours. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna beg you to come back and do some more sessions with us. Um, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> I know you have some, um, you know, like some training exercises you're doing uh, or, you know, helping folks get started. We'll post those in the comments um, so that folks can attend free of charge. Obviously, you're always really good about that. And um, and there's that, there's that GKE logging and monitoring quick, quick lab. That's a definitely highly recommend folks who've done EKS to see what it's like and how easy it is. Highly recommend it. It's on quick lab. It's called logging and monitoring. Nice. Well, so we'll try to get that in the comments, too. Um, Lynn, thank you so much. Anything else you want to share with us before we wrap up today? No, just know that, you know, that we're always here to help. So that, you know, Google is here to help. So just let us know how we can help you leverage some of these awesome services.